All right, there's the high sign, which means that it is time for episode 44 of Both Laugh, the Dying Scene Quarantine Chat Show. Uh, it's always a treat when we get to talk about more than just new music. Uh, and even though this week's um, guest has been a successful multi-talented singer, songwriter, musician for the better part of the last couple of decades, he's also a published author. His first book, and here's where I get to play talk show host, The Humorless Ladies of Border Control, came out in 2016. And it was an awesome and fascinating uh, deep dive into the punk rock diaspora in Eastern Europe. And he's now got his first novel, again, to play uh, talk show host, Someone Should Pay for Your Pain, which is due out, I think, officially next week. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Franz Nicolay, thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me. Um, I, I should point out that it's also nice to have a fellow Granite Stater on the show. You and I grew up uh, about an hour and 20 minutes or so from each other. And we've made it to 44 episodes. And I think I've had two other New Hampshire natives on the show before. So it's Who always else? nice. Uh, well, I'm always, it's such a motley crew of people. It is. Me. So there's a local Massachusetts, I'm, I've lived in Massachusetts since I moved to college. I never moved back. Um, but so Daniel, who plays bass in a band called Rebuilder and books a lot of shows in the Boston area. He books shows like at Charlie's Kitchen, for example, which I think I saw you at a couple of years ago. Uh, right. He is from Manchester. And then there's a uh, a bass player from a band called Tiny Stills, which is based in Los Angeles, but their bass player, Chris, is from Dover originally. Okay. Um, so those are those are the other two. I think you're number three. <laughs> and your hometown is? I'm, a, I'm from Nashua. You're from Nashua. Cool. Born, born and raised. Yeah, in I know uh, Brian Viglione, Dresden Dolls drummer, is, yep. is from Southern New Hampshire. And then it just, you get into like uh, Seth Meyers and Jimmy Fallon, you know, Gigi Allen, uh joe perry i think and steven tyler have connections and ronnie james dio was from dio. i believe Portsmouth. Yeah. um uh who's the woman who had the zine uh in the 90s um oh no uh i'm blanking on on the name uh, so it'll come back to me yeah it's when it, when i complain to people about our scene from other parts of the country it's like we had we had very little scene to begin with. Even even Nashua, which was a city by New Hampshire standards, uh, isn't a city. So we either went to Boston or to Portland or to Providence or to, uh, that was about it. Yeah, <laughs> Occasionally I mean, Lowell would have shows, but. I guess, we, I'm guessing we're about the same age. I remember yeah. there only being, the only scene I remember from when I was in high school was jam bands in Portsmouth. Yeah. That kind of thing. I would go to the Stone Church occasionally, sneak in. Yeah, the, there were, it feels like there was a small sort of like punk rock and hardcore scene in Portsmouth. I know bands like the Bruisers came out of that scene and the Queers like a decade before that, but that was oh, yeah, really- Oh yeah, Joe Queers from New Hampshire, of course. Yeah, but that was really, I mean, we had the Elvis room for a couple minutes there, but that was- <laughs> Well, I was by no means hip enough, you know, as a teenager to know about that stuff. Yeah, but uh, to, to bring it full circle, the first, the, you know, my the first punk shows I started going to on a regular basis when I when I moved to New York were uh, were at the Wetlands. Those sort of like Sunday, uh, it, it was a lot. I remember being a lot of like lookout bands and moon yeah. bands. So it'd be yeah, like right. queers, Mr. T Experience, right. Slackers, right. Mephiscopheles, that sort of thing. Yeah, those were my formative punk rock years, uh, yeah. which. Sometimes I look back at fondly. <laughs> um, so let's, uh, you've called yourself before a musician who dabbles in writing. Now that you've got your first novel coming out, is it fair to still call you a musician who dabbles in writing or is it fair to switch the labels around now? Yeah, I wonder. <laughs> I mean, I, <laughs> I think, you know, if someone, to, to the extent that people call up my name in their memory and think about what I am, they probably, uh, slot me in musician you yeah. know if you look at my wikipedia page it's that's 95 percent of it right um but you know my day job now is 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 primarily teaching writing so for what it's worth i mean that says more about the fact that it's slightly easier you know to institutionalize a writer yeah. than uh in you know in a in a college and university setting than than it is to 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 find a place for a rock musician right <laughs> um but uh, so all the, I mean, all that to say that, you know, income wise, it's, it's about 50 50. Where are you now? You're back on the East Coast because you're back in California. For a while. Yep. Okay. Hudson Valley. Um, 
and uh, back in in the same village that I was living in before that we were very happy in, and, and I'm I'm thrilled to be back. That's great. Um, to be brief, I'll try to. It's it's always when I talk to people who have written books, and this is probably the third or fourth uh, such guest we've had on this particular show. It's I I become such a fan of the book, and I try to do without giving away too many spoilers. I've never played like movie or book critic before because you can give spoilers on an album because you're trying to relate it to something for people so that they know what they're about to listen to. But uh, I try to it, encapsulate the book without giving away too many spoilers. Uh, but to be brief, it's a book about a, a gentleman named Rudy who travels to uh, the Mecca that was uh, Gainesville, Florida in the late 90s, uh, joins a band that became sort of locally important and then they went their separate ways and he strikes out as a DIY musician. And all that that entails, it's sort of road novel and the good and bad of band dynamics. And it is, it is a fascinating read. And I would imagine that as somebody who has traveled the world for many, many years, uh, applying your wares as a musician and collecting stories that, that you've been told a hundred thousand times that you should write a book, you should write a book. Because I get told that just on my little sort of peripheral. Uh, and so this seems like it's a, it's a fun response to those folks that you should write a book. Here, here's all the stories. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, a lot of the stories are made up out of my own head. You know, that's why it's fiction. Um, and you know, there's a lot of real stories that I would never put in a book. So, right. uh, you know, this is this is, I guess, the the first book, Humorless Ladies, was a was a nonfiction travelogue in a similar world, although on the other side of the earth. Um, and this is this is a novel because you can do different things in a novel, um, and it was a different technical challenge to write a novel. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's part of the same project of, of sort of trying to capture this world that you and I both exist in and probably your listeners do too, um, as authentically as possible, because, you know, um, these, these worlds mutate and disappear. And before you know it, they've, they, um, you know, people don't remember what they were like, <laughs> you know, I guess we'll see, you know, in the, as the, as, 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 touring life reemerges from the pandemic like are you know is that a is the world of DIY touring that started in the 80s um will that come to seem a relic that lasted for about 35 40 years right um and uh, or or is it going to or is it going to come back i'm not sure yeah, I hadn't even thought about it in that context. And what an interesting time. I mean, it's an interesting time for anybody to be putting out art of any sort the last 18 months, but particularly a book like this that may realistically become uh, almost a thing of the past, or at least its contents might become a thing of the past because uh, it'll turn into an archaic way of doing things. I hope it doesn't. But I mean, I, any book becomes a thing of the past and a, <laughs> and a portrait of a past of a past time, regardless, right? right. It's a matter of how fast. Right. So when, how long were you kicking around the idea of writing the novel before uh, you actually put pen to paper and said, okay, I'm writing the novel? Um, I had been asked to, I wrote, I wrote The Humorless Ladies, um, and then uh, I had been asked to, con I had written some short fiction. Uh, I've been asked to contribute a story to this collection that some, a guy I know in, in Scotland was putting together of, of fiction based on replacement songs. Oh, interesting. And I'm sort of like a, only a casual replacement yeah, fan. Same, yeah. I sort of keep to myself given, yeah. given the like old steady fandom world. Yeah, I uh, definitely uh, missed the replacement boat myself. Yeah, I mean, we can get into that topic. Yeah, right. <laughs> but anyway, it was, I, I, the way I thought about that offer was as a, as a writing prompt, right? Like, and, and it was a guaranteed publication, so I may as well try it. Um, and that be, that was the uh, more or less what's now the first chapter of, of the novel. So I finished that. I thought this is really interesting. This character is, is really you know interesting to me. Seems like there's a lot more that I could write about it. And um, and so I, I I figured I would try to to expand that out. Um, was it tough to separate the real world stories? Because I would imagine that there are a lot of real world stories and things that happen that have, that sort of appear in novelized form. Was it tough to, um, as an exercise to, to be able to 
to remove enough of the details of those situations in order to uh, make it pass for a novel? I mean, it's funny, you know, this is, I've, I've done a couple of interviews about this novel, and I think the question you're asking is one that's come up that, that has been central to all the interviews, which is, which assumes that this is a buildings roman, like this is a loosely yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. version of things or people that exist in the world. And I just, I don't, I don't quite know how to answer that. Yeah. It's not, yeah. but the fact that, that people are so insistent that it must be is, <laughs> is um, says something about the way people consume novels, right? right. But on the one hand, there's this insistence that the mandate is that you don't stray too far from your own lane and you write from your own subjectivity. Um, uh, and that sort of, and you know, auto fiction is the, is the, is the word of the day. And that sort of implies that there is no such thing as fiction. Um, and, and, and I feel like that if you value fiction as an art form, you have to push back against that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, obviously I'm writing about a world that I know, um, but I think about it uh, in the same way that if you're writing a, a campus novel, for example, you have, you have recognizable types. Um, you have the absent-minded classics professor and the officious assistant dean, and everyone recognizes those characters without having, you know, to go, oh, wait, wait, you know, where does this author teach and who's the one-to-one, -one, who's the assistant yeah, dean yeah, right. at that that this is a, a loosely disguised version of. Um, you know, I think everyone who's been in a music scene knows versions of, of the kinds of people that are in this book. Oh, absolutely. And I think that that's part of why maybe it comes across as though this has to be mostly or, or at least semi true stories, because the book is so uh, real, I guess, for lack of a better word. Well, that's Meaning what you, that, like, of, you, you of have to be able to write that. what you know, and, and, and it is it is completely and totally authentic. Good. As it, <laughs> and having, having never Although, made Although the result of that success is to is to, <laughs> is to try and is that everyone's going to assume like I'm Rudy or you know someone that I know is Rudy or like who is so such and such based on it's like well you know I don't have a teenage niece that's never come <laughs> yeah, on tour with yeah. me like there's all like there are demonstrable there's de it's demonstrably fiction sure that, you know. Right. <laughs> yeah, at no point I don't know did what I think, else to say to that question. Yeah, yeah. I, at no point did I think you were Rudy necessarily. It just seemed like the stories are so real and so relatable that you that you do a, a a fabulous job of putting the reader into a lot of those different scenes. And even if you've never like I've never been a touring musician, for example, but I have been to enough shows and been to enough uh, venues and interacted with enough people that they're all in the book. Like you can, you don't have to close your eyes to picture it. Like the scene is right there and it is perfect. And I feel like I know all those characters even knowing very little about them. It seems like, that, like it's weird. real. Like that's, 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 I think what you, what you want out of the thing, right? Like I get, you know, they ask you when you're, when you're, when you're putting out a novel, like who do you think, who is your imagined audience or who's your ideal audience for that thing? And my, answer, which is not what they want to hear, but this is my, the, my answer that I keep to myself is that, is that I want people who have been, lived this kind of life and been part of these kind of worlds to have that feeling, to feel like, um, yeah, he got it, like, this is what it's like. Absolutely. Uh, it, down to, down to the way that the tile floor looks like uh, in some of the, the venues, and yeah, it's uh, really didn't have to, uh, close my eyes to and use my imagination much. I was like, oh, I feel like I've been there. And I yeah. haven't. <laughs> Why I mean, that's one of the things where it's, you know, you take some fictionalized license, right? Like I used sort of the 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 the, the footprint of Gainesville, you know, and I read I read that guy's Gainesville punk book to sort of get a feel for because I wasn't in Gainesville in the 90s. Yeah. yeah. Like there's a lot of stuff in there that's, you know, a fantasy like there's no, there's no Coke bar in Gainesville, as far as I know. <laughs> like, there's no Morris column in a plaza, as far as I know. Like, I just right. had, I had to make some of that stuff up to, you know, for my own purposes. But, Why choose I, Gainesville? Gainesville has has become this sort of, uh, I think, mythologized place, especially that that place and time in particular. That sort of mid to late '90s Gainesville, at least in the punk rock scene, it has has taken on this sort of mm -hmm. mythical status. Why choose to to set the book there? Yeah, so um, it's a place that I know enough about that I could that I could at least make 
a start of it. Also, the character that I was trying to write was someone who was, you know, like a decade older than me. Um, you know, because I was thinking about some of what I would, you know, in regards the relationship of Rudy to myself, like Rudy is is a character that I would I wrote as like a cautionary tale. Yeah. Like, what if I hadn't have gotten married and had kids and gotten <laughs> right, right? You know, where could you end up? Because we know people like that too. Oh, absolutely. And somebody of that generation who was like just out of college in the '90s who was interested in that sort of thing, like Gainesville, was the sort of place he might wash up, and and end up in this kind of world. You know, yeah, it seems or Hoboken or Olympia. You know, maybe Chapel Hill. Yeah. Um, but if if I wanted to write about a punk world that I that I sort of knew something about, Gainesville was the obvious choice. And also, yeah. there was a sort of thematic. Um, you know, given the course of his life, I liked the idea of him um, starting in the south in the heat and get moving farther and farther north into the cold as he, yeah, you know, as a sort of metaphor for his his mental and emotional state. See, now I have to read it a third time. <laughs> <laughs> I tend not to think in metaphors, which is which is probably to a, a fault of somebody who reads an awful lot, but I tend to not read in metaphors and, and, and pick those things out. So now I have to read it again. Yeah. Well, writers, if they're any good, are, are, tend to write in metaphors. Well, right. In addition to literal reading, so. Did you find that it's easier to write um, a novel like this than it was to write Humorless Ladies? No. It, it does, it, does it work different muscles in your brain, which I know much harder because humorless ladies, you know, I was just describing things that happened. I took pretty detailed notes on those tours. And so um, I didn't have to think about the structure. The structure was going to be chronological. Um, I just had to look at the notes from that day and expand them. Mm. Um, the only thing that was, a, it was, you know, it was a little bit of a challenge to, to include, to figure out what of the, the research and external reading to include. But the basic structure of the novel was there and, you know, some percentage of the words I had written along the way. So, you know, that was that was pretty straightforward. A novel, you know, I, I'm making it up. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I started, I had that in, initial chapter and I said, okay, what happens when he wakes up? You know, what happens in his past? Like, what's, how did this guy get here? Uh, what's going to be the all the, you know, all the, all the things that make a plot and make a narrative and make a structure and, you know, who are going to be the, the ethical influences on him, both good and bad. And, uh, you know, um, do you actually want to give a guy like this a redemptive ending or do you, or do you need to be a little more judgmental of him? All that sort of thing. It was much harder. It took, you know, took a couple of years. Oh, really? Okay. From the time that you that you wrote the um, initial piece, the first chapter, that first was... chapter I wrote in 2015, and okay. then I didn't do anything about it for another year, and then I wrote the most the the rest of the initial draft between 2016 and 2018, uh, and then you know you revise it, you shop it around, you find a publisher, you work with the editor, you know, three years later, here we are. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's been five years since I started working on the novel seriously. Uh, but two years of, of sustained work. Yeah, yeah, that is, um, I mean, granted the, the record industry moves at a snail's pace sometimes when it comes to being able to actually put out new music, at least in physical yeah. form, and especially with how backed up vinyl pressing is nowadays. But um, yes. so there's not really a, a lot of instant gratification there, but that's got to, that just sort of moves that to another level, waiting a couple of years to put a book out way worse and because you're, <laughs> because you're working in isolation in a way that that you almost never are in the music uh, world like to get to get feedback from yeah uh, from people you know you can send your drafts to trusted readers but to, in terms of getting feedback from people you don't know <laughs> right to commit to a project and not know if anyone's going to read it for three four or five years is is very difficult Right, because it, when you're writing music, you can at least woodshed ideas with uh, other songwriters or play versions of songs. We've all seen bands that played early versions of songs that either never saw the light of day or that turned radically different by the time they were actually published. 
Um, no, absolutely. But, like, uh, you know, writing a song, I, I think I may have even put this this thought in the book is that, you know, not that it it um it comes in an afternoon every time, but you can reasonably expect that. To yeah, happen. right. And if you want to, you can go play it for someone that night, probably. Right. Or you can play it now on Instagram live or whatever and get some right. get some feedback or record it and put it on Bandcamp. And right. you, just, you can't do that with a novel. That's just never going to happen. You can't write a chapter of a novel in 10 minutes where you can write the 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 best songs are always the ones that oh you know, this song just came to us in 10 minutes and it was there and we just that's added parts. I'm not sure that's what I don't I, I don't always agree with that. I think that <laughs> good, you know, in any in any genre. But but yes, occasionally you will get a fully formed song very quickly. How many different uh avenues? did Rudy go down before it, at least internally or in drafts before you, before he ended up where he ended up in the last, let's say third of the book and, and the sort of um, culmination of a couple of different life's events for him. Again, I hate to spoil anything for anybody, but there's a few significant events in the book that he could have, they could have gone a little differently. Um, how many different iterations of the ending of the book in the last third did Rudy um go down before you settled on this one? Yeah, it's a question. I mean, when I started uh, expanding out the, the chap, the, that first chapter, I had a pretty good idea that I would have to, I was going to have to tell the story of Rudy and Ryan and their backstory, and then bring it forward to some kind of confrontation. And it did feel like it had to be that sort of confrontation because there is like a, a crisis of masculinity. Mm. Masculinity crises, crises often manifest themselves in sort of dick swinging metaphorically yeah, right. or, or, right. or literally. L right. Um, you know, in terms of in, it just like basic sort of, you know, contests of dominance. Sure. Right? Um, and then I wasn't sure where, where it was going to go after that. That didn't, didn't seem like a whole book to me. Right, like there had to be, there had to be more to it, to 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 make a novel. But I, but I figured that I would write. It would take me a while to write, at least that far, and then by by the time I'd gotten there, hopefully I would have the idea for, for for what the second the back half of the book would be, and that's and that's sort of what happened with the the Lily narrative. Okay. Yeah, Lily is, presents an interesting character, and she. Uh, is one that I didn't necessarily see coming. And yet she becomes entirely relatable uh, as soon as you meet her. And, and, or when they go to the diner, I think is real, the first sort of real interaction, aside from when she's a little kid, right? And, and as the father of a now teenage daughter, I sort of, I can picture both of those parts of Lily, like real vividly, because they're staring at me from across the living room right now. Yeah. <laughs> It was, she's she's a very interesting character, and, and she becomes very important to the last uh, third of the book. It, to back up to something you said before, um, Ryan and Rudy. Well, Rudy is the central character of the book, and for people that haven't read it yet, Ryan is um, initially he's his protege, and then he becomes famous, and then Rudy becomes looked at, even though he's the older, more experienced musician, as Ryan's protege. So there's that interesting, as you said literally and figurative dick swinging contest that comes uh, in and Ryan starts his own label and is this successful uh, musician and Rudy is sort of always able to at least tour with him and put out music with him for a while and then things take a, a very weird and unfortunate turn. Yeah, his ego can't can't handle it. Yeah, it, it, fascinating relationship between the two of those. Um, is that sort of, was that the first real narrative that came once you started working after the first chapter? Was that sort of the first narrative arc that, that you worked on? Yeah, pretty much. Um, you know, it's basically a star is born in some right. ways. Right. Uh, the classic, you know, a classic showbiz parable right. um, in, a, in, a, in a world in which that, that, that narrative hasn't been written yet. Um, yeah, Rudy and Ryan, I mean, I, Obviously, in the in the worlds I've been in, you get a lot of opportunity to think about why certain people succeed and why people don't, and how mm -hmm. little it has to do with 
how good you think their music is, right. how good they think their music is. You know, there are certain intangible qualities that, that encourage people to, you know, because at the end of the day, you're trying to, you're trying to connect with people. Um, uh, and, and people make connections with music for all kinds of reasons, including um, feeling welcomed in by the artist, you know, right. Or like the artist's, uh, you know, psychological needs to connect, you know, which I think is something that Ryan has. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, and um, you know, there's a way in which when you're, when you're young and you're in a music scene, everybody's in a good band. <laughs> all your friends are in bands and that, you know, you, you think they're all good for the most part. And, and, um, and, but, you know, 10 years down the line or even five years down the line, you know, one or two of them have had success for all kinds of reasons and, and other people have, have fallen off and, and some, some of them are okay with that. And some of them, some of them can't handle it. Um, you know, I think about what happens to, I, I don't always think of Rudy as having made a conscious choice for the life he came to have, right? He just sort of like, there's an image in, um, to, to quote another great chronicler of, of the punk scenes of our times from the, of the most recent Comet bus, where you're okay, yeah. the idea of like, you're marching alongside all your friends, you're arm in arm, you're part of this huge column. And then all of a sudden you look around and you're on your own that everyone else has sort of peeled off along the way. You're like, what happened? I right. thought we were, you know, <laughs> thought we were doing the thing. Right. Um, you know, you wake up and you're 35 and, and everybody, and people have gotten married and started having a resume again. Yeah. Life has a way of happening around you, whether you want it to or not. <laughs> right. And you have to be paying attention to that and conscious of that. And I, and that happens to some people. Yeah. yeah. And, and one would imagine that it's quite an interesting reckoning when that moment, when light dawns on marble head there and you realize whether it's at 35 or at 45 that, uh, oh, now it's time to do something else oh shit, what am I going to do? That's something else. Yeah, absolutely. Because like you said, everybody else has been building resumes and, and that comes up for a while in the book too. There's an interesting conversation between Rudy and a former bandmate about, you know, he has made his uh, life choices and left the music scene behind. And and the I thought it was interesting him trying to connect with the, um, not the soccer moms, but the moms at the playground. And yeah. as, as somebody who has tried to do that myself, because that, I've always had a much more flexible job than my wife has. So she, she travels into Boston and I am kind of float around. And so I've been the dad trying to connect with the moms at the playground. And because you're the tattooed punk rock guy that they kind of look at you different. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. <laughs> all about it. Yeah. I kind of read that part. I went, Oh, he's, I think even in the, the liner, the, the call, the side of the book, I read, Oh, he's talking about me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's I, I thought, I thought you were going to reference in the acknowledgements where I made a point of, of, you know, I wanted to thank the, 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 the babysitters and the, and the child caregivers. Oh, sure. You know, that's something that, that, um, that my neighbor, Sam Hunt, who's a novelist did in her, in her last book. And I thought that was such a wonderful gesture that I wanted to, to copy that. You know, Absolutely. That if, you're, if you're a, if you're a parent creating, you know, um, part of the, Part of the team that makes it possible to you to create is those people who who help raise your kids while you're <laughs> while you're holed up in your office right. trying to pull out the next chapter. Did you treat um, the process of writing the book, writing this book in particular, um, the same as the process for Humorless Ladies, or even for writing music? If you're under a deadline and trying to put out an album, did do you structure your days the same, or is like novel writing different or is it a different approach for how you even physically go about it it has been different because just because the circumstances of my life were different um when i was writing the humorless ladies i had i had just become a father i had like a six-month-old daughter uh, i was living up in toronto and i um, and my wife and I were, uh, she, she was on like a, a particular diet for a medical reason. And so I was on it with her. And so I wasn't drinking, uh, which opened up a, a minute, several extra hours in the evening. Sure. Yeah. 
and, and a six month old baby goes to bed relatively early. So a lot of that book was written, you know, between eight and midnight um, <laughs> on any given night. Right. Um, this one, I had, I, you know, I had some rolling deadlines. Um, I, you know, I, I, I was going on writing retreats and I got a lot of big chunks of it done on those because at that point I had two kids and my wife was working a lot. You know, she's a, she's a professor. Right. Um, and um and so it was a lot more haphazard i wasn't like i was working on it every day um but i would steal a week here and there where i would just go and really bang out 40 pages um in various places and that yeah i don't know just circumstances music again is comes way easier yeah. so if, for example you know i know there's you know we'll get a we'll get a an email from craig from the hold steady saying hey you know it's getting about that time, work on some new stuff. Everybody send me your material. And I say, okay, now, you know, I'll sit down, I'm going to sit down and write three or four hold steady demos. And that, you know, doesn't take that long. It's a, I know how to do it. Yeah. yeah. You've, pretty, you've used those muscles before. <laughs> I've used those muscles. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's like going to the batting cage or trying to hit a baseball. Even if you, if you grew up playing baseball and you take a while off, you, the muscles are still there. Exactly. You right. You'll figure it out. I mean, which maybe goes back to your first question is like whether I'm basically a musician or a writer. <laughs> I think basically I'm a musician. <laughs> That's the part that comes to eat that it comes easy. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, you need a challenge too. One of the interesting things that you do uh, in this book, and there are a lot of them, is um, there are times where you'll there are lyrics for a variety of different artists' songs, whether it's Rudy's songs or or Ryan songs, or I think there's a couple of even opening band songs who are who are mentioned in there, and so that's got to be an interesting thing as well to put yourself in the head of these characters that you've created and then to write music for them, because they do fun. they it's do so come fun. from a, a different place and you can tell. You sort of talked about Ryan's need to connect with his audience and sort of the songs that Ryan sings versus the songs that Rudy sings, at least the way that they're um, lyrically presented, is very telling about those characters. Was that yeah. was that a cool thing to do? It was, and it was, and I've always liked writing to a genre as an exercise. Mm. You know, like sitting down and saying, "Okay, I'm going to write," you know, a 32 bar Tin Pan Alley standard. I'm going to write a talking blues. I'm going to write, you know, um, like the revival tour style folk punk ant sing along anthem. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'm going to write, I'm going to sit down and write hold steady songs. You know, I, I find it much easier at this point in my life to do that and think about like, here's the box with it when, within which I'm trying to write towards. Mm. Um, uh, then sitting around waiting for, you know, this magical inspiration from above yeah, yeah. Right? and so to think about like what kind of person what kind of writer is ryan what kind of writer is al pashlow what kind of writer is rudy and then to sort of write in that direction or like you know especially like what kind of writer would rudy have been when he was a you know when he was a pretentious teenager right to write, right you know and how has he progressed from there um all super fun and also, like you know, to sit down and 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 write a, a fake pitchfork pitchfork review. Yeah, right? yeah, right. Write, write to these to these to these. You know, it's setting yourself writing exercises. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's um, it's different than writing dialogue for because you can you can create the character in your head, and so you write from their point of view. But it's a different exercise to then turn that into music. Did you have? actual it music isn't, it isn't. i mean it's, it's it's an extension of dialogue oh yeah right, right. Like, like jules talks differently than rudy does um you know if jules was a songwriter his lyrics would be different than rudy's right so it's it's just sort of like it's part of the same category how is that what what is that person's way of expressing themselves in your head was there music to go along like have you written those songs or at I least did. fleshed out those songs i did actually and it occurred to me to to try to record a like Franz Nikolai sings Rudy Povert record, yeah, yeah, yeah. but um, I don't want to, I'm, I'm a little uh, on the fence about 
that is so like again like we talked about earlier that association that people inevitably have of the author with their protagonist well, like right. i want to encourage that and play with it in sort of like the philip roth way or do i want to keep that um keep keep that 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 barrier yeah i suppose you would have to do all of the songs and not just rudy's right because yeah because there there will be that one-to-one -one connection that way for for the audience right. i think and you know honestly like the songs i write are not the same kind of songs that rudy would write. Mm -hmm. you know rudy's more of like i think he would probably think of himself in like the town's van zandt world you know and I'm that more he would that. think of himself as that yeah absolutely well when i think about like the kind of songwriters that that rudy would probably like to be associated thought of in that in the yeah image of yeah probably that like towns van zandt guy clark blah blah yeah. blah that sort of thing um and i'm much more of like a of a, of a tin pan alley right charles asnafor vaudevillian you know, whatever. So it would be, it would be different regardless. There's also this thing though, th like the perception versus the reality. So what, what I think Rudy in his mind, uh, the sort of songwriter that he is and what may come across to the audience might be two different things. And this is a conversation I've had uh, in other formats with a variety of songwriters and sort of what their, not necessarily what their goal is, but who they consider their peers to be versus um, how that translates to the audience. And you might end up with an, an audience that is different than the one that you think that you started out writing for. Uh, and I think that Rudy sort of struggles with that um, as much as anybody. I, I think about character. that a lot with that, that generation, you know, 10, 10 or plus years ago of, of people who were front people in, in punk bands and then picked up acoustic guitars. And yeah. you, you could sense their desire to be taken seriously as like Americana country yeah. type artists. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, that doesn't oh, work that well if people, like people associate you more with your, the, the, with your social circle as a musician than yeah. with your, your style, right? So if you came up, if you came up playing in punk bands on some level, people are always going to, they're not going to think of you as, as Jason Isbell. Yeah. Right. So, so I, I won't give names or at least not on the record, but so a very good conversation that I had, one of the very first interviews I did when I was just doing print interviews years and years ago um, was with a musician that we both know and, and I have talked to him about you. So I, I will preface this conversation by saying that. And, and he was one of those guys who picked up a guitar and did his own thing after being in punk bands. And uh, he was having that conversation with his songwriter friends versus his punk rock friends. And he had a conversation with another excellent songwriter who may or may not be visible over my right shoulder, uh, who, you know, he was telling him he wanted to go that route. He wanted to go the Isbel route. He wanted to go the um, Corey Brandon route. And the other guy said, well, why would you want to do that? Like, <laughs> there's also something to be said for, you know, uh, effectively for being able to pay your bills and to have food on the table. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, And it's a very different sort of place that you end up that way if that's not where you came from. Like you're, you've got success doing this thing. Why would you want to do this thing that we do? Because we can't necessarily eat. Now, obviously, Isbel does it okay for himself now. This was years ago, but um, yeah, it was an interesting conversation. I think there's two things about it. One is that is that there's this perception that your Americana type songwriters get more get taken more seriously as artists. Yes, um, and also that you can, um, you know, and you can get on like. The, the radio you know the radio shows and and uh, but but also that um, you can keep doing it longer and you can age in that world right more gracefully right. Um, I think the flip side of that is like your audience is your audience and if you you can make yourself really crazy trying to curate your own audience and you're gonna end up alienating people who like you if you try to reject why they like you right there's there's a fine line between you being successful in who you are and being comfortable in who you are <laughs> as, a, as a musician. Um, now that 
someone should pay for your pain is uh when's it officially out next week because i think that the date has kind of fluctuated a few times yeah they, the the publisher switched distributors and that and that delayed it for a couple months but yeah august 24th is the is the pub date although you know release dates are <laughs> another contrast to the music music business release dates are more of a of a general I, vague idea <laughs> Then a, like it appears on Spotify at midnight on such and such a date. Like I know, I know people already have this book in the hand from their pre-orders. Yeah, I uh, I've never gone to a bookstore at midnight to buy a book when it first came out, but I have definitely, obviously, gone to record stores at midnight to yeah. buy them when they came out. I mean, I think when like Harry Potter and stuff on that level, don't they might do that, but but your average book, it's like <laughs> sometime plus or minus a month around this date, you'll yeah. get your, you'll get your copy. Are you already uh, knee deep in the next project at this point because of the time frame that's gone on? Yeah, yeah, I am. So exactly. is it weird then to go back and talk about someone should pay for your pain? Because I know that you have to now, but you must be excited to about whatever's coming up down the road too. It is a little bit, but that's not unusual. Um, you know, like you said about vinyl production, uh, you know, oh, you're, often talking, you're often talking about a record that you finished a year ago at this point. Um, you know, the last Hold Steady record we finished at the end of 2019, and it didn't come out till February of 21. Um, so- Was it really that We had already written, you know, a couple dozen more songs. So it's, right. you know, that's just part of the deal unless you're, unless you're, you know, surprise releasing things or releasing things straight to band camp or whatever. Um, that's the nature of the business. I can't believe it was that long in between, but yeah, you're right. The, the last, 18 months. I was talking to somebody the other day and we talked about that something happened in May and then neither one of us could remember which May it was. If it yeah. was May of this year or May of last year, they've all kind of melded together. Yeah, there's a time travel aspect to, to the pandemic here. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Sure. I mean, I was living in, in California, it turns out for three years, but in my mind, it, I, I thought it had been maybe like 15, 18 months. Yeah. yeah. Were you living there during pandemic? Yes. Yep. And then move, so had to move coast during the pandemic. So you've had well, an interest. It, it, I, you know, do we think the pandemic's over? <laughs> but yeah, well, we, we moved certainly after, don't. <laughs> we moved after we got vaccinated. That okay. That, that happened. Um, <laughs> no, I mean we we my wife had a job at at UC Berkeley. Um, got tenure. Um, pandemic year was very clarifying for us as for a lot of people, I think about where we wanted to be and where our social networks were. And, and you know, nothing's official yet, but here we are back in the Hudson Valley. Cause I mean, I for one have tremendous affection for this, this area and it's within striking distance of New York which is where, still where I feel most at home hmm. uh, and all that. Um, so you've, you must have an interesting perspective. What did you have on the radar? This is usually what I start every conversation with is what did you have on the radar when pandemic started the first time? Mm -hmm. uh, when, when the first round of lockdowns came out a year and a half ago, what did you have uh, on deck? I know obviously some hold steady stuff, but what was in the pipeline for you that you had to either rework or do differently or put on hold um, because of the last 18 months? Uh, it was hold steady stuff, you know, we had a, a year full of, of, of shows that are now, most of them are going to are scheduled for 2022, which is frustrating, including going back to Australia for the first time in 10 years. Um, Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, we were going to go back to Ukraine. Um, my wife's uh, working on a 33 and a third book about the first Ukrainian punk record. So there was oh, some wow. writing to be done around that. Um, and I was supposed to be working on this, this third book project, which I'm... I already blew one deadline, but I'm plugging away at. Um, yeah, that's what that's what it was. I mean, in the initial months, one of the one of the projects that I did was I, I finished writing my next solo record. Um, but then I had to sit on those songs for another year, you know, because you can't you couldn't get in the studio. And then, right. um, you know, I wanted to work with my buddy Ara, uh, who the drummer from the Slackers and Leftover Crack. Um, and he was in New Jersey and I was in California. He, and we, we, you know, we didn't feel right to get on a plane. So yeah. you know, that felt like a project also that got, that got delayed for a year, um, 
which we now have recorded, but now it's going to be another year because of vinyl production <laughs> before we, so that'll be like a two years later right. <laughs> thing that I get to talk about next year too. Right. <laughs> that, man, will you wait until vinyl is ready to release? Because that's another conversation that's come up a lot recently is the idea of, is it a good idea to wait until vinyl is available before you release things or release them when they're released and then you'll get the vinyl whenever it comes in? Yeah, I mean, that's a conversation I had with the label that's going to put it out. Um, and their feeling was, you know, Jeff Rosenstock can do that, but not everybody can do that. Fair enough. <laughs> you know, because that was my thing. It's like he announced Scott Dream, you know, you could get it. You could pre-order the vinyl, you know, for nine months down the line. Right. Um, and they were like, yeah, he can do that. But even he's not going to sell as many copies because of that, because it's not good. You know, the vinyl's not available when everybody's talking about the record. Um, and even even him, you know, I just got the email yesterday saying that's all been pushed back again, even even from that. Um, I don't know. I mean, I it seems to me and I'm not an expert on any of this, but it seems to me that we might have to move on from vinyl, you know, if it's going to be like this. Um, well, you're you're something point yesterday. To, to yesterday to the effect that like obviously the major label types right. who are who are hopping on the vinyl train you know because they can reissue and repackage all their catalog and sell it for 45.99 um and jump to the front of the line in terms of production like if they really felt like that that it was going to be sustainable they would be investing in more pressing plants but they're not you know you are absolutely correct yeah. So they, they're just trying to get their money. And then, you know, when people get sick of waiting for vinyl and move on, then, you know, then that's what it is. You are absolutely correct. There is something to be said for CDs, which cost a buck and you can have them in two weeks. Right. Uh, but not everybody has CD players anymore, but I, well, I don't know. Yeah, but people not... also put out tapes nowadays and that, that, is baffling to me. I didn't like tapes when they first were around. <laughs> I mean, aside from the fact that you could record something off the radio and have your own copy of the song, which is, I guess, the early days of pirating, but yeah. I wouldn't know where to find a tape player now. Yeah, I don't, I don't think cassettes are really, uh, I don't, I don't get that. I mean, I, I, I also have nostalgia for the cassette mixtape, but, um, sure. but I don't want to release records on cassette. I mean, <laughs> I think we're going to, I think there's, there, there might be a business in reconsidering CDs. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but um, but they're just they don't have that that sort of vintagey cachet yet, I think, that vinyl and cassettes have. Um, but maybe we'll get over that. I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, I have this record in the can. I'd like it to come out before next summer. So <laughs> I'm thinking about that a lot, about like what are the what are the alternatives? Um, but I don't have enough, you know, I don't have enough market power as a solo artist to really drive any of that. So um, it sort of then becomes like the Kickstarter model, right? I mean, if you're if you're like people like Jeff Rosenstock, you can have the album now and then just get the vinyl when it comes out. It's sort of like a, a more official um, Kickstarter philosophy, right? So like you buy the album now and we'll send it to you when it's ready, but here you can at least listen to it. Yeah, I mean, I did that in 2012 with right. my Do the Struggle record, or the not actually that one was legitimately a Kickstarter. The this, the next one to us, the beautiful was like I I I ran a, a bootleg Kickstarter at, off of my website because right. I didn't want to I didn't want to give them a, a percentage. It didn't seem right. necessary, but in it to to do those pre orders a year in advance so that I would have money to make the record. Right, right, right. That actually kind of worked. I don't know if it would be repeatable um, and I didn't need to do it this time. You know, Jeff, obviously he can, he can produce and he can self finance his records. It's, it's sort of a different thing. Um, and he's in a great position and, and God bless him. You yeah, know? Right. <laughs> it's, um, you know, one of he's managed to make a great career doing things exactly the way he wants to. And absolutely. And, you know, no critic I have no criticism yeah, right. of the way he does things. Yep. Kind of amazing. It, yeah, it's sort of fascinating to watch from this side. Yeah. yeah. As I was a little late to the bomb the music. I'm a little late to most uh musical trends, which I credit to being from New Hampshire and just sort of the trickle down. Uh, but I was a little late to bomb the music industry. So when I found out sort of what and who Jeff was, I was oh wow. So it's been a really fascinating thing to watch from this side of the aisle. Yeah. 
Um, I don't want to take up too much of your late morning. This has been uh, fun for me. People should read. Someone should pay for your pain. I will hold it up again. Pretend I'm Conan or whatever. Uh, this is it's a fascinating book. And as I have said before to people that would listen, if you if you were been involved in touring music or you've been in the DIY scene or you've gone to punk shows or you've had weird family relationships like there's you're going to get it like it's a really good and fascinating and compelling read. Uh, people should buy it. <laughs> Thank you. The, the it. Humorless Ladies is a book that I love. Uh, it is a, it is, I think the audience is a little more niche, although I have actually used it as reference in doing a previous episode. I interviewed somebody that is living in Belgrade uh -huh. and uh, there was a, for whatever reason, there's a sentence about Belgrade in Humorless Ladies of Border Control that I, I think is something to the effect of that uh, Belgrade happens abruptly as when you're when you're driving into the, and it always sort of struck me for whatever reason having never been there but so i talked to this guy about your book quite a bit um someone should pay for your pain is like everybody will like it like it's it's relatable yes i hope so right <laughs> um thanks for doing this 